that in the land of ABC. And so he did his PhD with Concha um, in sunny Stony Brook, um, graduated in 2011, and then moved on for postdoc at the INFN in Frascati. Um, and from there, he moved to Brazil, first to the University of Sao Paulo, and, and then he got a faculty position at the Universidad Federal do ABC in Brazil. Um, so he's very well known for his work, I think, on neutrino physics or leptogenesis specifically there. And he will tell us today about neutrinos and how to use neutrino oscillations as a probe to study the physics. Thanks, Michael, for the very kind introduction. And, okay, thanks uh, for having me here. Very glad to uh, make it here. Uh, the background is not uh, Sydney. But it's in uh, South Korea. I was in South Korea uh, a week before. So the temperature is uh, very different. It's very warm and humid there. But the sky is very similar. Uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, how we can use uh, neutrino oscillation as a probe of uh, new physics. So part of the work has, is done with my collaborators here. And um, so neutrino oscillation itself is a new physics. I think most of you, everyone knows. So basically, this is a Lagrangian of uh, moving the neutrino fields, and these are the weak interaction of our neutrinos. So the new physics is basically the mass. So we can introduce a mass term, and this uh, neutrino prime can be uh, if it's the same field as the standard model fields. So we call this a Majorana mass. So if this uh, is a completely new degree of freedom, we call it a Dirac mass. So in principle, we have these two possibilities. And uh, then what we do usually is the master is not diagonal. So you diagonalize by rotating your standard model neutrinos and the new prime. The new prime, if it's a Standard model neutrino, so you rotate by the same U. And then this U is what we can measure in the through the big interactions, the so-called uh, leptonic uh, mixing matrix. So, uh, so how we discover uh, neutrino is massive is basically through the so-called three flavor paradigm. So in this three flavor paradigm, we assume that the U is basically unitary. It's a three by three unitary matrix. So basically, you can write the flavor uh, states at the superposition of the mass eigenstate. And this U has a three mixing angle, which has been measured to uh, very good precision. And the CP, when I think phase, is still, I would say, unknown. So they have some uh, hint. Maybe it's not. Uh, Okay, it's not zero or pi. And then uh, we have uh, two uh, mass uh, difference that has been measured to certain precision. And then we know this, this shouldn't be the whole story because the neutrino mass, the mechanism behind the neutrino mass is still unknown. So any UV competition or probably neutrino, they will feel the new interactions so this could result in a new measurable effects or some uh, beyond the three flavor paradigm. It's something that, uh, that could be expected. So it's a very brief introduction of motivations. And now I'll give an outline of my talk. So first of all, I will review the so-called three plus N neutrino oscillation uh, paradigm. So in this case, beside the, the three generation that I mentioned earlier, it's possible that we have uh, some n new uh, states that can mix with our neutrinos. And then I will review um, how do we solve uh, for the neutrino oscillation probability uh, in an analytic, analytical way or semi analytical way. It should be clear what I mean in a minute. Then uh, from these solutions, uh, we can we can gain some uh, okay, new insight, I would say, about the possible new physics that enter 
So the first new physics I will discuss is the so-called low-skill non-usability, where you have a new uh, mass eigen state, which is below the, the energy of the experiment. So they can participate, they can be produced yeah, in the neutrino oscillation experiment. Mm -hmm. Then they will talk about the so-called non-standard neutrino interactions. So this can come from uh, some new interaction of the neutrinos beyond the weak interaction. And then I will discuss about an interesting scenario, the so-called quasi dirac or sometimes uh, pseudo dirac neutrinos. And after that, I'll discuss uh, the possibility of uh, new physics only come in from in, at a high scale. So you have to describe using the uh, effective uh, field theory. And finally, I'll talk about one UV model, which uh, is one of my favorite. Um, a brief review uh, for three plus n neutrino oscillations. So this is the U. Now is instead of three, three by three, is a three times n times three, and three plus n times three plus n uh, unitary matrix. So beyond the three uh, standard model flavors, we can have uh, other uh, more flavors. Similarly, the mass eigen state needs also to be extended to uh, 3 plus n. And we dis uh, describe the evolution of this flavor eigen state using the uh, Schrodinger equation. So, this is the uh, we Hamiltonian. Well, uh, HI is an um, is, uh, interacting uh, Hamiltonian. So, in the standard model, this will be the, the terms coming from the weak interaction. And then all the neutrinos are relativistic, at least in the neutrino oscillation experiment. Okay. Energy is much greater than say, 0.1 EV. And uh, what we are interested in the so-called amplitude, which is the neutrino at certain distance. So you like to measure the flavor content of neutrino, which uh, produced. Okay, this notation means that at zero distance, they are alpha flavor. Some x distance, we like to measure the flavor content. And then we can study the evolution of this quantity. Um, just rewrite uh, this Scrodding J equation. And then the probability is just the uh, absolute square of the, this uh, amplitude. Okay. And it's very convenient if we go to a so called vacuum mass basis. The Q mass basis means that the free Hamiltonian is uh, diagonal. So we can change uh, by multiplying by U, dagger U. And then this is Hamiltonian in the vacuum mass basis, where the delta is uh, diagonal. And then the interaction term is no longer diagonal. And we can still diagonalize this uh, Hamiltonian with a unitary matrix, you know, this emission. And these are the eigenvalues, we call it lambdas. And then this is the S in the, in the S tilde is the S in the vacuum mass basis. And then you can relate it back to the S in the flavor basis. And of course, uh, this way of solving uh, can also we can also generalize to a, a metal potential which is not constant and change uh, in space. So what you can do is you split your matter into uh, layers. Each layer you can approximate it as a constant. So for each layer, you have a solution. And then eventually, you just uh, uh, multiply these uh, solutions together. So this D just means the spatial, uh, okay, spatial ordering instead of time ordering. So you multiply from uh, uh, from right to left, right to left, with increasing the uh, distance. Right? And then for each of these solution. Uh, if you expand this up, what you realize, okay, this is just your mixing matrix. But then you have this X. This is X which diagonalize your Hamiltonian in the vacuum mass basis. So this depends on your metal potential. So for, for example, if you can solve for this combination, then we basically we solve uh, the whole system. But this lambda, we can solve by diagonalizing, get eigenvalues. So now we have to solve for the eigenvectors. So to solve the eigenvectors, uh, that's a very uh, weak method. This is first proposed by uh, 
uh, Imura Takamura and Komakura. So the so-called KTM, KTY uh, methods. But they show it for three flavors. So shortly after that, Yasuda uh, generalized to uh, N, to arbitrary flavor. So the first relation is just a unitary uh, relation. This X is unitary, so you have to compute this. Then the, the second is just uh, you diagonalize the H, H uh, tilde. Then you can diagonalize H tilde square using the same matrix and so on until uh, you, you form a set of uh, equation linear in this combination. So then you can invert this, uh, this uh, X, this combination, in terms of only the lambdas and the Hamiltonian H tilde. That means if you you solve the whole thing, you have to solve these uh, eigenvectors. Okay, this is complicated, but basically, you can see it just depends on the H tilde, the, the elements of your Hamiltonians in the vacuum mass basis, and depends on the eigenvalues. So, for example, for four flavor, since you can solve the polynomial up to uh, of order. <coughs> So you can solve this exactly. You can have uh, four eigenvalues exactly, and then you can you can solve for the uh, eigenvectors. Oh, can you speak up a little bit? Ah, there was basically a sound was dropping in. Okay. Okay, have you tried? So uh, here, please uh, let me know. And so basically, this is just for illustration. So you can write down the four flavor solution on one page. So everything is uh, analytic. There's no approximation. And um, so this method is useful. Uh, so basically, for n greater than four flavor, uh, so eigenvalues you have to solve uh, numerically. But then you can still, after you get the eigenvalues, say the five, six eigenvalues, then you can still get all the uh, eigenvectors in terms of these eigenvalues and elements of the Hamiltonian. Okay, uh, let's look at the three flavor scenario again. Because uh, then, we, okay, H tilde, I think I forgot to define. So basically, H tilde is just, uh, go back to it. So H tilde is basically U multiplied by X. It's a mixing matrix in the vacuum multiplied by the eigenvector X. So this is called U tilde. So basically, in matter, X will be, uh, in vacuum, X will be identity. But in matter, X is not identity. So this is, uh, this is just a general uh, combination, the Yasko combination. So let, let us try to see uh, what we get. So if you substitute the solution that I showed you earlier, three flavor. So you can show that this uh, combination, the Yasko combination, is equal to this uh, Hamiltonian. This is basically the Hamiltonian include the metal potential. And then this combination, if you sum uh, this uh, okay, 1, 2, 1, 3, 2, 1, 2, 3, 3, 1, 3, 2, it always goes to zero because uh, the U is unitary. So that's why I call this a unitary relation. So if your uh, mixing matrix is unitary, the vacuum mixing ma matrix, so necessarily, they have to fulfill uh, these conditions. So for n flavor, so you just generalize this k basically to, to uh, n flavors. So one interesting uh, identity you can obtain is when the metal potential is diagonal. So this is like in the standard model, the weak interaction, the metal potential is diagonal. So if you look at this, uh, this is basically the mass difference the eigenvalue in matter, lambda 2, 1 means uh, lambda 2 minus lambda 1. So, uh, yeah, I forgot to define. Let me see if I define. Yeah, I forgot to define. Okay. Um, okay, I have to go forward. Okay. Um, so this uh, also, yeah, it's basically lambda two square minus lambda one square divided by, oh, this is, yeah. I'm oh, sorry, there's no square. It's basically the different, basically just a different. 
So if you if your metal potential is uh, diagonal, so you can see that this is equivalent to the uh, free Hamiltonian, of, uh, which uh, which that does not depend on the metal. That's why that this relation for metal, all the quantities are the metal is exactly equivalent to all the quantities in a vacuum. This identity holds when you have a diagonal metal potential. And uh, so let us look at uh, one of the possible uh, new physics, so-called low-scale non-unitarity. So this, what I mean is uh, you have new and like sterile states, but the mass is below the experimental energy. That means in any experiment, you also produce them. So they can participate in the oscillation. But since their mass is a bit heavier than, than the rest of the, the, the light neutrinos, so the oscillation is fast and we can os uh, if we can if we can average them up. If we can do that, then uh, at leading order in the small is active heavy mixing. So the Hamiltonian in the vacuum mass basis is still giving given by uh, this uh, relation. But what is different is the U is no longer a uh, unitary. It's still uh, three by three. But after averaging out, yeah, so they are losing something. So basically, this U is no longer unitary. So this is what I call so-called uh, low-scale non-unitary scenario. So if U is not unitary, then when you sum up these two, so if remember uh, earlier, I mentioned this sum should, should all give zero. So now, that since u is no longer unitary, so they are proportional to u, u dagger, uh, beta alpha, where beta is not equal alpha. So if this is not zero, then, uh, okay. So it's proportional to this, this is precisely the term which, uh, which, which uh, result in, uh, okay, the term which says that the u is not unitary. But in vacuum, this uh, relation simplified. So it only depends on the mixing uh, matrix in the in the vacuum. We can see clearly that uh, in the unitary limit, this all, all of this goes to zero. So in the non-unitary uh, scenario, this NHS identity is correlated as well. Like you show uh, okay, this is just a, a plot to show the this uh, combination of this sum, which is supposed to be zero. I mean, all this line are uh, the case where it's not zero. And, uh, so I just choose the value, which is still consistent with the experimental constraint. So the straight line you can see is basically in the in the vacuum case. So they do not depends on the energy of the neutrinos. And then the the solid line is basically the case where I choose uh, the matter potential to be a constant. So it, it depends on the Matter potential. Um, then on the right, what I plot is a, is a combination of the so-called NHS identity. So remember that in the vacuum case, this equal to the corresponding uh, combination in vacuum. So this value will be this uh, black solid line. You can see hard to see. So this line is basically the same for vacuum or uh, matter case. But then when you introduce non-unitarity, you see that you deviate uh, from, from this black line. So the dash line is again for the vacuum case, and then the solid line is for the case in the constant metal potential. So they all deviate from this uh, black curve. When you have a uh, unitarity uh, scenario. Okay, can I quickly ask some sure. here? So, so what explains the features? So on the left side, you have the, the change going of up. sign. Yeah, this, ah, you mean why? So, so basically, why is it um, going down um, for larger energies? And then you have that maximum mm -hmm. around 1 or 10 GV going down, is that? Yeah, to be honest, I, I don't know why. Because when I change the... The uh, non utility uh, is for example the face, the thing can change completely. So, okay. getting the feature is not always like this, so it's mm -hmm. very hard yeah, to, 
No, yeah. But it's a good question. I, I, I don't know the, yeah. the reason behind this. Um, yeah, so please stop me if you have any questions. Uh, it's nice to explain on the spots. And the second type of uh, 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 new physics could be uh, the mental potential is modified. But in the standard model, you basically have one plus, okay, plus uh, this, sorry, this part, the neutral current. But you see that the neutral current, you just put it there for completeness. But in the standard model, see it's coming the same way, so it's a common phase, so it won't affect the oscillation. So usually the standard model is a one, zero, zero. Because this common neutral current, you can remove it by the common phase uh, with definition. But then what, what's important is that this uh, epsilon, so if we have some new interactions, so it's possible that they are not zero. So for example, this is just one of the UV model that is considered. So usually this, this physics will come in at a low scale, so a new physics at low scale. So in this case, they have a new light gauge boson, which introduces uh, this, uh, this uh, epsilon mu, mu mu and tau tau. Um, so yeah, it, what, one important thing is uh, even if you have a non-standard interaction, if your U is unitary, you still fulfill this relation because it's a unitary relation. It's independent of the your mental potential. Um, but now, if your U, okay, your V, sorry, I want to say this, mental potential is no longer diagonal. So the NHS identity is modified. This is still unitary, but if your mental potential is no longer diagonal, so you have a new terms. So it's precisely proportional to the, to the off diagonal term in the metal potential. So, so if you have NSI, which is diagonal, for example, you only have these two. So you still have the NHS identity. So NHS identity is related only when you have the off diagonal uh, NSI. Uh, this is just a slide to show you what I, uh, I mean. Um, so for example, here I set the, yeah, the diagonal to have uh, this value. But I also turn on the off-diagonal. So the black line is basically the off-diagonal is zero. So as you can see, this is basically the NSS identity for diagonal potential. So it's, it's the same as, uh, as uh, non-NSI. So if you have only the diagonal NSI, you cannot tell, you cannot tell the effect. But then uh, if you're off diagonal, you start to see the, the deviation. But of course, this is uh, this always in matter to see the effect. So basically, the diagonal case is indistinguishable from a uh, from, uh, vacuum case. So they are the same line. But then the, in order to see the off diagonal, uh, in order to see the NSI, uh, it has to be off diagonal. Okay. Okay, uh, so this is just a slide to show that even if we consider non-trivial matter effects, for example, I consider the earth crossing neutrinos, so the matter potential is changing. So you can still see the, the deviation from the standard scenario. For example, on the left is the non-unitary scenario, on the right is the NSI scenario. And this is just a, a strategy that uh, I propose. So first of all, we can try to investigate the unitary relation and see whether it's zero. Okay, with some precision. So if it's yes, then we can check the NSS identity. So if it's no, we, we know for sure. Okay, at least in this framework, that there's a low scale, or there's a unitarity relation. U is not unitary. But if it's yes, then we can go on further to check this identity. Okay, experimentally, it's not easy because it has to measure everything. But if we can check this, if it's, if it's satisfied, we cannot, we can only say that the metal potential is diagonal. So maybe that's NSI which modify the diagonal part. If it's no, then 
we call this NSI. By definition, modification to the metal potential. And then in this scenario on the on the right hand side is more challenging in principle. So if you discover the uh, non-unitary, because sometimes people just say non-unitary also induce the NSI. Because it also cause uh, off diagonal in some sense. So it's very difficult. I think in principle it's doable, but it's more challenging to, to distinguish whether you really have NSI on top of the non-unitary in this case. Um, okay, the plot that I make is, is a, a code that I implement. So I, I implement these uh, solutions that I showed you earlier, up to seven flavor in these uh, Python codes. So the, the, the earth density profile that I use is basically a simplified, so I just consider the, the few layers you can see. Four layers, uh, simplified model. I can input your own uh, more precise uh, earth profile. And then with this code, of course, we can study a more complicated scenario, for example, six flavor. So quasi dirac basically means that instead of the three mass eigenstate, what actually happens is each of them, actually they split into a, a pair. But this mass splitting is much smaller than what we can measure for now. But they are constrained as the mass splitting they can be. So if, if you want, we actually have a six uh, mass eigenstates. So this kind of scenario it can be realized. For example, uh, if you write this is the standard model neutrinos, and then this is uh, the sterile state, the right-handed neutrinos. So this is the, the matrix, the so-called uh, Majorana mass entry, the diagonal, and off diagonal is the Dirac. So you can realize a quasi Dirac or pseudo Dirac scenario. If the Dirac master is much bigger than the Majorana master. So in this case, you have a three pairs of a quasi Dirac or pseudo Dirac states. And then the splitting is proportional to the, basically the Majorana master. Okay. Or proportional to the, the ratio of Majorana over the Dirac master. So this, this kind of effect can be seen. For example, um, this six stream meaning that the, the splitting of the third mass eigenstate. So for example, if you put 10 to the minus five EV square, 10 to the minus four, so the effect will be more and more obvious. Um, yeah, I'll mention, I think maybe in the end about, yeah. uh, for, for example, this kind of mass splitting is still allowed for the third mass mass eigenstate, but for the first and second, so the solar neutrinos impose a very strong constraint. So it cannot be uh, so big. I think it has to be smaller than 10 to the minus 11 EV squared. And what if a new physics only comes in at a high scale? So in this case, we usually treat the standard model as a effective field theory. So for example, uh, dimension five, we have only one operator. Operator. So this comes in, and this gives rise to Majorana neutrino mass. But another effect which can give a modification to the neutrino os oscillation is uh, this term, the dimension six operator. Because uh, after electronic symmetry breaking, what you obtain is a modification to the neutrino uh, kinetic uh, terms. So this kinetic term is a its identity is the usual terms plus the contribution from this dimension six uh, operator. So you have to uh, redefine your field to get a canonical kinetic terms. So you can diagonalize the, this D. Okay, I, I just uh, skip the, the each step, but basically you have to redefine by these uh, eigenvalues. So you end up uh, modify this mass term and also the okay the, this uh, stuff you also appear here this the d and then after you diagonalize the mass term so in the end this u is given by this uh, combination uh, when you rotate to the mass eigenstate so if you look at this u they are no longer unitary 
Because if you check U, U dagger or U dagger U, this is no longer identity. Of course, if a D hat is, is identity, then since Y and V are unitary, then you get back to the usual scenario. So this modification basically result in the D hat, which is not uh, identity. So that means that uh, from this point of view, um, uh, new physics can also result in uh, non unitary uh, mixing uh, in the nutrient sector. So we can also rewrite this in a mass basis. So this U is no longer uh, unitary. So in this case, when we want to discuss oxidation of neutrinos, usually we, uh, we normalize or rescale the field such that uh, this uh, quantum state is still normalized to one. So U, no one divide by this. But then we can also check the, the overlap between the flavor eigenstates. So basically the overlap is in general not zero because uh, U is not unitary. So, so that's why uh, I call this also, this, is, this means the two flavor states are not orthogonal. So what changes in the in the this evolution equation I showed you earlier? So basically, instead of u, it becomes u bar. Instead of u dagger, it becomes u inverse. Besides this, it, there's also a new terms which appear in the matter potential, which n inverse. So basically, just to recall, the n is the overlap between the two flavor states. So in a unitary scenario, you get back. So basically, if you focus on this Hamiltonian in the flavor basis, it's not emission. When you can check, it's not emission. And it's also not normal. These are not equal. But you can do the similarity transformation to change to the vacuum mass basis, the so called H tilde multiplying inverse and U bar. So then you get this relation, uh, this Hamiltonian delta is diagonal. The potential, and you see that this is actually a Hermitian, and the eigenvalues has to be real. So that means even in this case, although it looks not emission, but it's only apparent because they still have real eigenvalues. So that's not, not really a problem. Um, I'm doing with time. Uh, I have some 15, 20 minutes. Okay. So, so now I'm trying to make an assumption. Uh, let's assume that the flavor state space is complete. We have the E mu tau, nothing else. If it is complete, I mean, at least uh, what we expect is a space of which is generated by your few in the flavor, flavor state, a flavor basis. So you expect that for, if you generate alpha, the probability of detecting the beta, sum over all possible beta, should be one. At least uh, if it's complete, it should be one. But if you check uh, this just example, if you check this uh, probability at t equals zero, this is just overlap at t equals zero, there's no evolution. Then uh, when the beta equals alpha, this is one, because uh, these few are normalized. But then the rest of the contribution in general is positive or non-negative is uh, absolute square. So that means that at t equals zero, this sum actually is greater than one, it's not uh, one. So the one question we can ask is uh, how do we calculate the probability if the, the basis state is not orthogonal? Which is uh, the case we are looking at. So for a non-orthogonal complete flavor basis, okay, we can still write it as uh, this is what we have seen earlier. Just a review. Uh, since mass eigenstates are autonomous, so it implies this uh, completeness relation which is uh, well known. But now if you focus on the non-orthogonal flavor eigenstate, the overlap is not uh, delta alpha beta. So you realize that you have to modify the completeness relation by introducing this factor. 
It means we have to use in order to, uh, yeah, we have to make use of this uh, relation when we want to deal with the non orthogonal table. Uh, yes. um, so now I'd like to discuss how do we calculate probability in this scenario. The probability, in a sense, is not observable because there's no commission operator we can associate with it. But usually, how do we calculate? And let's go to the autonomous states. So we insert a so-called projector. It's an operator. So we project alpha to beta. Then we get, uh, OK, this uh, usual bond rule. Right? So this projector satisfies this uh, projector square equal itself. If you sum over all the projector, you get the identity of the result. So you know it holds, of course, when these uh, states are autonomous. So what is the projector for non-autogonal states? So from the completeness relation we seen earlier, so the, the projector will be, you have this form. So if you sum over beta, you get identity. You can also check if you take a square of this operator, you get back itself. So that means uh, the projector will change. So you can try to do the same trick. You just replace this projector by this uh, new projector to calculate the probability. If you do that, so we have this, this substitute here. Then we realize that for oh, okay, this is supposed to be alpha. So uh, alpha, okay, this no, sorry, I think this is fine. Yeah, this is fine. This is when gamma equal beta. So we have this beta beta. So this is when gamma not equal beta. So if you look at the first term, this is always uh, positive or non negative. But then this second term in general is complex. Uh, I think I, I'm missing another term here. I'm sorry. Yeah. That's another term V. Okay, nu gamma nu alpha. So basically, I'm, I'm trying to say that this is a complex number. That means if you try to just calculate probability using this way, it seems like you get some nonsense. This cannot be a probability because it's complex. So you'd like to find some something which is uh, this object, P, dagger. Okay, S is the amplitude that we've seen earlier. Such that if you sum over this beta, you get this n tilde inverse beta lambda. Good, if you get this, so you can use a completeness relation to show that if this sum over beta always give you the total probability of one. So for autonomous case, as you compare, so this B hat is basically these two deltas. It is in here, you get the usual bond rule that we have seen earlier. So, to construct this, uh, I realize this has been done in uh, quantum chemistry because uh, usually they describe molecular orbit as a position of atomic orbits, and these at atomic orbits in general they are not orthogonal. So they are used to using basis, which is not auto orthogonal. So what they do, uh, I use a two flavor scenario that is more geometric. You can easily imagine than the three flavor. So basically, this is a uh, any states. So one and two is basically your basis, which is not orthogonal. One and two. So one perpendicular. This is uh, the one which is orthogonal to one. And two perpendicular is the one which is perpendicular to the two. And um, so this is any state. Uh, you can project into one and the one which is orthogonal to one using P1 and Q1. So basically, Q1 is the one component which is orthogonal. And then you can do a second step for the one which is orthogonal to one. You can project to two and the component which is orthogonal. That's why it's P2 and Q2. And then you keep doing this. And for this component, you project back again to one and the direction which orthogonal to one. So this you project to direction of one and the one which orthogonal. You can keep doing this. And you can also start uh, from the two direction. Instead of project to one, first you project to two, P2 and Q2. And then keep, keep doing this. 
So in the end, this is a method that they do because eventually they can rewrite, they can collect everything, which eventually project to P1. And all the terms eventually project to P2. So this is basically the component which is in the one direction. This is a component which is really the two direction. So by construction, uh, okay, the probability is basically the square of each of this operator, P1 square. Get P1 again, then P1 Q2 square, you get Q2 P1. Okay, P1 square is P1 again, you get Q2, so on. So the sum of the square. So by construction, this sum of square, if you sum up, you get one, basically by, by construction. So that means this is uh, how you construct this uh, so called probability operator. Because now you can use this. Uh, Operator, if you sandwich between the initial state, then you, you find what's the probability is, is being in you know, the, the one direction or two direction. So, this, this is basically a series, but actually, you can always, uh, it's always a con convergent geometric sum, even in a three flavor or more flavor scenario. So, you can use this identity. And and this n since it always has to be something smaller than one. That is a, a, a mixing matrix. So, so it, you can using a geometric sum and you get a, this operator for the two flavor scenario. And then now you can calculate the probability. You just insert, a, okay, this is basically, I want to say this is P11. This hat or without hat, but I think I define maybe with without hat. After you, you substitute in, then you can insert the completeness relation here and completeness relation here. And then this object is what I call P hat in the beginning. This is what I call the S amplitude, S alpha to lambda, S alpha to zeta. Let's conjugate this so called beta. But then in the two flavor, this. Uh, is the object is as a very simple form. So if you go to injury case, this is just zero. So you have the one. So this uh, you get back the usual scenario. So for trick flavor, it's more complicated, but you can still carry out the same exercise. So I need to read, right? So just to show you, you can solve it. But just to compare uh, with and without modification. So in the case of constant metal potential. So with modification, you see that the sum is always one. And then this is just uh, uh, the solid line is the solid line is the is the let me think, I think it's a standard case, yeah. And then the other is a with modification. Um, and then with no modification, you can see okay, the solid line will be the same for the red and blue curve. Purple. But this black solid line is basically the sum in the case where you have uh, this uh, non unitary effect. So it, without modification, you see that the sum is in general not equal one. And uh, then you can also consider a more complicated uh, metal density. For example, this of crossing neutrinos. Okay, this is always one, the sum, and then this is not always one. So this is basically the same kind of plot, but with a more complicated uh, matter density. Okay, that's a caveat in, in what I just showed you. Because I, I assume that the flavor basis is complete. When, when you, you have this uh, modified kinetic term, which result in non unitary uh, mixing U. Uh, what it, but this, for me, if I start from a, a UV model, usually you also imply the flare basis is actually not complete. Besides the E mu tau, you have more. So because all this construction assuming complete flare basis, so maybe this is not compatible, but I am not able to prove it yet. This implies the flare basis is not uh, complete. So maybe this modification doesn't make sense if this implies the flare basis. Because you have actually instead of three, you have four, five, and more. It doesn't have to uh, sum up to. 
Okay, uh, the last part I just want to mention a UV model. So I have maybe some minutes. Okay, yeah. uh, this is just a model that we have looked at uh, more or less recently. So it's a UV model that uh, gives rise to quasi Dirac uh, spectrum of the light neutrinos. So it's interesting because it gives deviation to neutrino oscillations. And it can also give rise to leptogenesis in this model and the dark matter. So basically, the extended gauge sector, we extend the standard model to, to duplicate to SU2 prime and U1 prime. Then we also duplicate a few contents. So for example, we have a, this is a standard model leptons and Higgs. This will be the, the new sector or the so called mirror sector leptons and Higgs. Then we connect. Both this sector with the N. But this N itself is also uh, have a Dirac master. So they are N prime and N. So you have the Dirac master. So they are connected through this Dirac master. So you just look at this simple model, you can get the so called uh, Dirac seesaw. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a wave of the new Higgs. It's a V prime, the wave of the new Higgs. So you get a uh, very similar to the usual C song, but it's a Dirac C song. You got the partner, it's no longer itself, but the partner is basically okay, the new, the partner of new L is the new L prime, which is a mirror, mirror sector neutrino. So the Dirac neutrinos. So the Dirac formula is, is modified because this V prime in principle doesn't have to be equal to the standard model uh, left. Okay, so at least a new Yukawa coupling. But then we analyze this model. We realize that, uh, okay, the conserved charge is a standard V to V prime. Okay, assuming we also duplicate the quark sector, then we have V prime. And the lepton, the lepton number also, we have to generalize to include the mirror leptons. So we notice that this is still conserved. I mean, this whole quantity is conserved. So this Y, I mean, the, okay, the number density divided by entropic density over V prime. Basically, after all the the, nutri the heavy direct neutrino decays, so we see that this two has to be equal. I mean, the charge in the mirror, the B minus L charge in the mirror and our sector has to be has to be the same, and in general not zero. If this decay violates uh, CP, so here we can we can say that the asymmetry in the mirror sector will result in the maybe asymmetric uh, mirror barium. This is uh, one of the scenario of asymmetric dark matter. In some sense, they are related because uh, the number density on asymmetry in B minus L is related. And then in this model, we still have something that's analogous of Davidson in Barabound, but for this uh, seesaw Dirac model. So in this case, due to neutrino mass constraint, we still need a pretty high scale. We have a viable. And there's no low scale signature, and it's worse than the usual case because uh, there's no neutrino that's zero double beta decay. The neutrino is uh, zero, so you won't have that signature. So, to, to improve, so we introduce a small correlation of uh, this the generalized B minus L. So, as a result, this is a new term that we introduced. This is much smaller than the master, and we also introduced this uh, new Yukawa, which is much smaller than the Yukawa, which uh, conserves the, this uh, generalized B minus L. So this can arise from a spontaneous broken of this, of this uh, operator when the phi get the back. So in this model, uh, what we have is we have a spectrum of a heavy neutrino, which is split to quasi Dirac pairs, and our light neutrinos that we can observe in oscillation experiment is also split. So since these are split, since both of these splitting come from the common sources which we introduced. So that means there's a relation. So for example, if you want resonant electrogenesis, okay, this splitting we have to adjust to certain values. Okay, then we can have low scale electrogenesis in principle. And this will be related to the splitting in the light neutrinos. So we can we actually show this relation, 
the CP validation for lepsogenesis is connected to the mass splitting of this light neutrino. This is delta M, meaning that the mass splitting of, of any of any pairs of the light neutrinos divided by the absolute scale. So this is just a, a, a bit busy plot, but first maybe you can focus on the one on the right. So this is just a parameter space where the leptogenesis can be viable. So this M is just the, the direct mass of the heavy neutrino. So this is when they are very heavy, so they are the successful regime in this way. So when they are one TV, so you can have this area. Or when they are even lighter, you can have successful leptogenesis in this area. And then the diagonal red line is basically the mass splitting of the light neutrinos. So this is actually a toy model because we consider one generation of the quasi Dirac pair. So we are right now generalizing to a more realistic, for example, the two generation. But at least we have some idea what are the parameters space. And then this is a mass splitting that can actually be observed because this is basically the mass splitting, the quasi Dirac mass splitting. So this is 10 to the minus 12. EV squared, 10 to the minus 9 EV squared. So this from 10 to the minus 12 to 10 to the minus 6. So this is basically the sweet spots where okay, epigenesis are possible. But the constraint basically mainly, I would say solar, and then there's actually a big gap. Uh, yeah. But still, in principle, uh, it's possible to constrain. One interesting thing that I learned recently from this paper, uh, Ansari Fat and Fazan. So basically, they, they, they show that uh, from the solar neutrino data, there's a hint that you fit a bit, uh, the data better if we have a, a new quasi Dirac mass splitting of 10 to the minus 11 EV squared or less. So I think this is interesting uh, hint. Or if it's not, we can exclude at least uh, so part of this. Uh, Okay, uh, this is just a takeaway. Uh, take um, so, okay, uh, I uh, try to convince that neutrino oscillation is a useful probe of new physics beyond the standard tree flavored paradigm. And then uh, using these uh, analytic solutions, so I think we can, for example, differentiate between neutrality relation or NSI. So this is just basically uh, uh, what I mentioned. You can actually, because you need you, you still have to fulfill the relations. And uh, so, uh, yeah. So if we are fortunate the new physics are beyond the energy reach, then maybe we have to keep going for precision study and hopefully we can see some deviation in the three standard or three flavor for your attention. Thank you very much. So we have time for questions. Um, maybe let me start. Let me start. Can, can you go back to that the, when you introduced that model in, in the end? Yeah, the first slide maybe just to start. So, so there is, okay, so, so you impose in addition lepto number conservation, is that right? Um, in the two sectors? They actually did not impose. Or, or you, could, you could write down a Myrana master in principle for the. That's right. That's right. That's what we did. Yeah, so, so you yeah, post that. Yeah, right. Yeah. You yeah. did not write it down, but then we are imposing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can write it down with the outbreak integration metry. That's right. Yeah, okay. Good. Now that's. So I'm just wondering, so, so you, you could set, write down a symmetry there, or it's probably, they have to be connected, right? Because you can write the N prime, N bar, yeah. N prime. Yeah, you can write it down because, yeah. yeah. Because N actually are singlets uh, under everything. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so you can actually introduce them. Mm -hmm. But then when we introduce, we introduce in a small way, we claim that maybe they come from, yeah. So some small break, yeah. Yeah, which is suppressed, yeah. Okay, that's right. 
Thanks. Uh, other questions? So checking online because there's, I don't see any hands up online. So if you're online, you can just speak up. Also. I don't see it. Um, so for that model, can, can I ask once more? So there is that, do you have that, um, so delta total, which you have there as quantity. Um, can you explain why is it B minus B prime and then minus? So L, L total is basically L plus L prime. Kind of it's actually uh, somehow our uh, definition, the mirror sector have the opposite sign. The L total is actually L minus L prime. Ah, so okay, that's why okay. It's a minus. Okay, it's a matter of definition. Okay, okay. So okay. that's why there's a minus for B prime, and then actually our L is also. There's minus also L a minus for, yeah. for, for the L prime. And I want to ask one more thing. So, so you looked at those constraints from solar neutrinos. Can you go to the constraints there? Um, so how about astrophysical neutrinos? Or when you have neutrinos which travel over, do you get constraints from yeah, those? Yeah, you say astrophysical, I think the constraints ah, something something much smaller, <laughs> which is not uh, favorable in any case for yeah, because we are also thinking how to close the gap. I think this is basically astrophysical. Yes, yeah, yeah. ice cream. Yeah. yeah, I think even supernovae people have derived a constraint recently. It's also in this ballpark. Yeah, but okay, it, it, constra it constraints everything below. Yeah, the so EIS is what? That's a good question because I think somehow they lose the sensitivity. They only constrain a window instead of all the way. If they can constrain all the way, then it's very nice. They can put because usually I, I remember the work in the supernovae, they constrain a, a window. It's not like constrain that they rule out a window of a mass fitting instead of yes. all the way like bigger than 10 to the minus. Ah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. But solar actually, I think they they kind of rule out, let's say, bigger than 10, 10 to the minus 12 EV square, but for the third mass in the state. Uh, one and two is still is still allowed. Still allowed. Yeah. So that's right. There is okay. So so, but you have to then sit in that sweet spot around ten to the minus nine. Is that right? So that's okay. Yeah, so I just think for we have a whole yeah, it's kind of model dependent actually. But uh, yeah. we pick, no, because when, when I read that correctly, okay. So neutrino energy. So that's where the measurement is taken. Right. And so it would then basically, so came 3 that excludes then, came 3 is came 3 that, right? Or ice cubes. Yeah. So, so that would include mass splittings between 10 to minus 12 and 10 to minus 20 or so. Because you can see from here 10 to the minus 6 up to 10 to the minus 12. Yeah, this is something that no experiment really. Not long probes. Yeah. Besides the third mass, I can say because solar energy has to everything bigger, I think 10, 10 to the minus 12 EV squared. But then the first and second, I think in this range is still uh, allowed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's good. Interesting. Okay, so then you can with that model, you generate those small mass splittings, which just fit in there. Yeah. Uh, because this must be thing is also required for resonance. So that's why we have this connection. Ah, for resonance. Yeah, that's system. why we have this uh, connection between the CP correlation for re mm -hmm. resonant resonances and the mass be. The delta M is too small, so it's, it's impossible. Yeah. If it's too big, actually, we have a, a wash up problem. Yeah. But this is also the area can be too big. But too big still is also uh, yeah, maybe constraining. But yeah. Too small. Good. Maybe let me give one more chance to the students to, <laughs> to ask a question. Postdoc. <laughs> yeah. Well, no. So, so let, let me ask one, one last thing. Sure. So, 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 to get that, that non unitarity, 
Yeah. yeah, at, at low scale, you got basically by having additional states which are not accessible. Low so, scale, accessible. Yeah. Accessible, you can produce them. Yes. But then the oscillation, you can average out. Because if you, you do not average out, that means you actually see them. You see I, the yeah, you can see the video oscillation, right? Yeah. Let's say if they are mass, you can produce them, but you cannot see the oscillation because it's too fast. Yeah. So then you get this scenario. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's kind of, uh, a semi model independent in a sense. Is yeah. there any other way to see them? So, okay. Yeah, it, it depends on. In beta decay, could you. Um, yeah, do you get a correction to beta decay? Is that still beta decay? Um, or it's not just, it doesn't resolve it, it doesn't resolve it. Because the masses would be, they would still be light, right? They would yeah, be, still, still light, maybe EV or some EV, some several EVs. But, but beta decay would put a limit, right? If you have uh, something which mixes somehow with the electron, the Drino, you could produce right. it in beta decay. And then that would should put a limit on that. Right. So something like mixing and uh, mass of that flash, right? I'm not sure. Yeah, maybe. Uh, yeah, they should be able. Yeah. I don't remember why it's the kinematics. Uh, yeah. Uh, above what limit they can. Yeah. Yeah, they I don't know. Admit, they house. cannot admit this guy. Yeah. Yeah. I, I know that maybe something to think about. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, Okay, I think we exhausted 